there are bands that will never get bigger than playing to like f- 500 people max like an, on a night every every night of a tour and they will keep going purely because they love it and i just think that's incredible like like the fact that some of these bands original lineups you know like they just do it because they can't stop and i think that's the aussie thing weirdly enough the aussie thing for me is i don't want to put it out there but i'm going to say it anyway the moment he retires i reckon that's it for aussie he, so he has I, nothing to live pe- for. People give Sharon shit, and I can understand why they give Sharon shit. But if Ozzy stops, that's it. And I don't want to see him go just yet. Yeah. <laughs> I think he needs to play. We are back. We're going to jump right back into it. My name's Benny Goodman. I'm here with Siobhan and Corey Peza and our original British ambassador, uh, music theory specialist, incredible guitarist, and just good friend of the show and of Lost Symphony, considering he plays on a bunch of our records. Mr. Richard Shaw, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. How are you all? Doing we are great. great. You're sounding very distinguished as always. I envy your accent. <laughs> Thank you. I, I group myself I, I don't know i i, I don't um I, I like how you say the original uk ambassador like i will always have that over steve wood as yes. much as i want to be steve wood he was never the original that's right yeah, so. that's right <laughs> Yeah. You've got a lot of um, like you know, cred in this show because you were like an original investor almost with your time. You wasted your time with us before anyone else, and we appreciate that. And that that has grown with interest. <laughs> it, it it's it's not a waste, you know. Yeah, I, I I yeah, I enjoy talking to you three. I know I know Benny likes talking. Full stop. Not particularly to anybody, but <laughs> it's it, I I enjoy listening to Benny. So I, it's it's all good. I'm just happy because, Richard, you're a perfect example of why we've kept trudging through the show, considering only my mom and, um, you know, four people that Corey knows at work. My dad. I have to make sure I shout out my and, dad. And his dad. That's, um, that's half our listenership right there. Yeah. It's because we've made a lot of friends on this show. Like, I, I got asked to join Shane Larkin's band. Like, Richard, like, it's funny because we talk to you and it's like, I feel like I'm P. Diddy now. Like, all these guests, I'm somehow I've interwoven myself into their lives like you've been a great friend of the show. You've collaborated with us musically. In fact, you sent me a song recently where Paul Lorenzo, the drummer from Lost Symphony, um, played on it, and I played some keyboards on it. And, and we're, you're working with a guy named Danny Beardsley. Can you speak to that? Because I can tell you, the song um, is incredible. Thanks. That's that's good to know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so yeah, I think last time I was on, I mentioned a project where somebody had mentioned just for shits and giggles, let's write a song that's like Alice in Chains going to a bar fight with Tremonti and Thin Lizzy. And and that that's how it was left. I wrote the song that night and just sent Danny the music to it. And Danny wasn't originally going to play guitar on it at all, even though he's a phenomenal guitar player, but he's a great songwriter and a great lyricist and, and singer. Uh, so I did all the rhythm guitars I think put a guitar solo down. He programmed some drums, put some vocals on it like the next day. We're like, what the hell? This is turning into a very, very quick song. And we're both very impressed with it. And the more we got talking about it and we were getting mixing it and we're like, we're adding things, adding solos, adding layers, acoustics and all kinds of stuff. And then it got to a point where it's like, I think we're going to be really regretful if we release this with programmed drums. And that's when we got in touch with you because of your offer we like if you need drums we have it and then obviously you added keys as well and now we're just getting into kind of a mixing and mastering kind of stage of it where we're kind of sitting on a million different mixes and masters where we go which is the best version <laughs> or how can we make it even better so that's what's taking so long the song didn't actually take long to uh, write and record it was it's more the the later stages where we're kind of thinking how can we get this to sound as good as possible and we are sitting on it for a while for that reason but there's no rush to release it uh and i think that's the cool part about it is we can take our time to make it sound as good as possible because bless him danny is is mixing and mastering him himself as well and he's learning a lot in the process and uh yeah he it, it, so it's fun every mix is sounding great but it's a case of when do we stop 
now. <laughs> That's the hard part. <laughs> well, how do we know part. it's done? Can you we know? speak to how unbelievable Paul Lorenzo is? Because the drummer from Lost Symphony, because I've said this over multiple um, episodes, the way that Paul writes drums and, and it, the best way, in my opinion, to get the best take out of him is to literally play the song for him on the spot, make him listen to it and just, just play. So we, we played the song for Paul on a Tuesday night, like maybe eight o'clock and he heard the program drums and, you know, he hates program drums. So he wants anything but that we went through it for maybe an hour and I'm like, that sounds pretty good. I'm like, I think we should send this to them and just see if like, this is the right idea. We sent the take to, to, to Danny and to Richard and they're like, cool. Thanks. We're like, you don't want, you don't want to know. No, these are the drums. And I've now listened to that song 5,000 times and the drums are perfect to the they song, in my opinion. Yeah. They're just great. And it makes it, if you listen back to the original, um, listen, one of the things that kills so many metal bands or like shredders and stuff is using program drums because you don't have that human feel. Paul can go listen to that. And it's such an amazing skill that in an hour later, he's composed these amazing parts that you couldn't even dream of programming. And it, it required like almost no editing at all. It was just that and that to me was so impressive and then the fact is when you guys wrote back and you're like this is it i went and looked at paul i'm like i guess we're getting good at this which made me feel really good because the song is truly fantastic and i cannot wait for people to hear it thank you and i agree paul really did knock it out of the park and you did such a great job with the keys and your all your help has been greatly appreciated by both danny and i and it's it's it's, it's just been a big learning curve for us because it was like, okay, we, I'm back to, as, as weird as it sounds, like in Cradle, when I was writing songs, it was almost like my job to write songs. And I loved it, but it was like, okay, you've got to write X amount of songs and you've got X amount of time to do it before we're in the studio, before we're on tour and all this kind of stuff. And this has just gone back to, I'm just writing and recording purely for fun. There is nothing, there's no agenda. We're not going to make money out of this. It's just like, this is pure fun. And it's always lovely when we get to work with pros such as yourself and Paul, because like you say, it's because Paul is so good that he can do that that quickly. That's why you hire these people. We could we could have had any kind of drummer. We could have any kind of keyboard player. We could, could have not had me play guitar solos on it at all, but it's like the, the reason we have all this goes for all three of you. It's like you have all this experience, and then it's condensed to that one moment. Like everything you've ever learned as a musician, there <laughs> you know what not to do as well as what to do, and you become very, very quick at tracking it. And that's it. It's like there you go, one take. <laughs> well, I, I had sent you yeah. unsolicited keys, so people know. Like you asked me to do drums, and I'm like, I think this should have keys in it. Like Classic inserted myself. Of. But the I'm but the reason it. but the reason being is because of something Corey taught me, and uh, I I figured maybe you didn't know this, and I didn't know this was so one of the things that like Muse does to get this huge guitar sound is they'll have the guitars, but they'll add these synth layers that you don't realize kind of are synths. So when I sent it to Danny, I, I think he was like, I don't know what to do with this. And I, when I explained it to him, dude, it's not meant to be like a keyboard part that has anything that you really hear. It's meant to make you guys sound like you have more balls. He's like, yeah. oh, and that was sharing what Corey shared with me, shared with you. Well, it comes back to orchestration and the power of what's going on underneath what you're actually hearing, you know, and it's, mm. I mean, similar with talking about Lost Symphony, there are some songs where you may not notice the orchestra is there, but when you, if you muted it, you'd be like, wow, there's so much power that's missing. And so it's not about necessarily everything shining all the time. It's about knowing the balance. And a lot of this comes to mixing too, is knowing how mm. to, how to put everything in its place so that it, it is huge, you know, and it is powerful without necessarily hearing all the little things going on. That's a great point in terms of arrangement and production that I think is the separates uh, amateurs from professionals or at least the more experienced people is knowing that uh, not everything has to be, you know, in the spotlight and and how powerful something in the background can actually be. And that, that can be, you know, whether it's parts, you know, instrumentation uh, effects like reverb and delay, like you don't need to hear the reverb sometimes, but if you feel it, it can change the entire vibe of a song, uh, and and so many other things. Backing vocals, I uh, I 
I am obsessed with like harmonies and backing vocals. It's like, I, I think they're the coolest thing you can do. And sometimes I, and when Ben and I were working on a lot of so more songs with vocals, we were far too overindulgent in it. But I now working on tracks with, with, with my artists uh, in my studio, I don't think I do any song that doesn't have three part harmonies. I just decide how much of that I want in the mix to determine how uh, obvious it is because sometimes I'll have them so low. This is making your main vocal sound fucking amazing. And that's all it's doing. It's not sounding like as a choir. It's sounding like that main vocal is the size of a Mack truck, you know, but you couldn't tell me that there's, you know, three or four layers of vocals. And that's almost more powerful than having this choir that, you know, that comes in and, and then distracts from what you're trying to focus on. Uh, you know, a little goes a long way, you know, the opposite of lost symphony. It's the, it's the, <laughs> the, sometimes that can be more powerful. I think I was teaching someone the other day and like, I, I think I said it last time about YouTube has opened up a word of like isolated tracks for, for anything. And I was proving a point with a student. He was learning like an offspring song. And I just said, just out of curiosity, how many guitars do you think are on? No, no, Offspring, sorry, Blink 182. And he was like, how many guitars are on this track? And he was like, knowing there's one guitar player in Blink 182, it's his, he was like, maybe two. And then we listened to the isolated tracks, and I think there was 12. Yep. <laughs> it was ridiculous how many guitars there were to make it sound like one massive mm -hmm. guitar. And we're like, this is insane. And it's like these little tricks you learn. But then again, it's like, would it have sounded just as good with eight? I don't know. <laughs> like, where, where's the line? Yeah. Where's the line? Would it have sounded good with one? And that's the thing I, I, I feel like that can happen with, we, we're seeing this with me and Danny with mixing and mastering. Now it's like, right, is it adding to the song or taking away? And that I still find to this day is difficult purely because it's a context-based thing. It's, it's different for every piece of music you'll ever do. Not even just every song it's almost like every part it's like okay the verse ah, how many guitars yeah. do we need here do we need the more keys do we need do we need percussion <laughs> like it's almost like right it's now like, we move on to yeah. a chorus and we ask all the questions all over again and you're like oh my you ever watch bob ross you know bob ross painting and you're and you're watching yeah. him go and, and you're like wow that is amazing and then he just takes his brush stroke and absolutely demolishes the camera you're like no no you ruined it and then all of a sudden it's like this beautiful tree that like the the picture would not have been complete without it but at the time you're like it was done already the cabin looked great <laughs> exactly the birds in the sky were awesome and then always one brush stroke yeah, away from perfection that's the thing is like you never know until you hear it right Exactly. It's removing the ego from it because the thing is when you're in like a band and you first start, like everyone turns himself up, turn my guitar up, turn my bass up, turn my vocals up. But then, you know, when you're like Corey or myself and you have to play all those instruments, you go, oh God, I should probably turn those vocals down. Even though it's you, you're like, it sounds way worse. And that's when you start becoming objective of when you, is when you lis listen to your own music as a listener, as opposed to just like, I played the bass, I played the super awesome keyboard part and it must be loud. But then you turn it up for yourself versus... That's sometimes why you, you go to another mixing person too um, is so that they have those objective ears and they're like, oh yeah, no, dude, you don't want that synthesizer part that loud. And they turn it really low in a mix, but you know, maybe carve out certain sound so that you can hear it if you listen to it. And that's basically Tool. I mean, Tool's like 7,000 layers where they basically said, here are the layers, man. And I, you have to make decisions, but it's about removing that ego and going, what's best for the song? as opposed to just being like, I'm going to put an Yngwie Malmsteen solo for three minutes over the middle of this. <laughs> well, I think I'm that's awesome. what's incredibly hard about being involved in the mixing process when you play an instrument in it. Because, I mean, I, I do this all the time, and I think it's natural for us. Whatever instrument we play or did play on the song, that's where your ear goes, you know? And so I constantly put the violin too loud compared to other things, you know? And it's it's not that it's wrong. It's just that I can't unhear that, you mm -hmm. know? So it definitely helps to have that objective you know, somebody that's that's uninvolved emotionally, musically from the song in some ways, you know, just to hear it. Yeah. I have the opposite problem where because I know what I played, I don't need to hear it as loud. So I end up turning my, I send like, I do guest solos for people and I record it and I actually send it back and they're like, can you turn the guitar up a bit? And I'm like, why would I do that? <laughs> like you like it's it's gonna ruin it and it's be, and i think it is because subconsciously i knew what i played down to every little nuance that i can i think i can hear every single nuance but they probably can't and all they need is just like 
half a dB, and then, then those nuances can be heard by everybody else. And uh, even in, when I was in Cradle, like the, the the crew used to really take the piss out of me. Like they're like, "How do you play to your mix?" Because I had the tiniest bit of me in my ears, but everyone else was really loud. Mm. And I don't know. I think because I'm playing to them. I don't give a fuck about what I'm playing. I, I'm like, I trust my muscle memories there. <laughs> so I don't need, I need to know what they're doing to bounce off of. I don't need to hear me. When I reverse engineered Dave Mustaine. Okay. And I actually asked Dave Mustaine this one time. Okay. I was like, how I answered the question. I do this. Like I do on the show. I asked him a question and then answered it for him. I, I was back st- outside w- stalking his bus in Providence, maybe like 20 years ago. I'm like, how do you sing, uh, play all those crazy parts and sing them at the same time? Like, do you just program your hands? And he like looked at me and goes, yeah, that sounds about right. And that's the truth is because you have, you're playing blind. You're, pl- you can't blame the fact that you can't hear yourself when you play live on the fact that you suck live. You have to play perfectly. So you already know what you're playing perfectly. So in fact, you're, you're, playing to the other people in the band which is why when you go when when you went and saw cradle of filth with you which i thought was the greatest lineup ever it sounded so freaking tight because you are literally like ninja tight with the band because you're listening to them not even yourself which is crazy yeah and i i I don't know about you guys but i came from a background of playing like pubs and clubs like bars and things where it's like i didn't have monitors yeah, I, I never had monitors. Even when I play uh, guitar for like musical theater productions, only it was only about four or five years ago I started to have monitoring at musical theater productions. We were just in an orchestra pit and then go, there you go. That's your mix. Where Wherever you're sat is your mix. <laughs> and that's it. I completely relate to that because that's classical music. And and yeah. that's one thing that I notice immediately, even like when I joined Starset, you know, and we just did a whole acoustic tour. And what happened, which is what always happens, is it becomes the loudness war of we have three stage monitors and everybody needs to hear themselves. It's like, oh, push me up a little bit, push me up, push me up, push me up. And the whole time I'm saying, no, we should practice behind these monitors purely acoustic. We're playing acoustic instruments. Let's let's try playing just hearing what we hear in the room. And if that sounds good without the monitors, it's going to sound great out there, you know, because you are getting the best sound you can get organically out of your acoustic instrument. And eventually that's what we did over the whole court. You know, it got to a point where it was unbearably loud, you know, like playing to monitors for an acoustic tour that was like at 100 dB at some (laughs) points. And I'm like, this is insane. (laughs) This is absolutely insane. I remember being 15 years old and going and playing with like a, a, a production, a, a theater production, a local theater production. And the only amp I had at the time was a half stack blue voodoo crate. So I showed up to, to play theater, like Bye Bye Birdie or something. And I have this full blown half stack, this blue half stack crate. And they're all looking at me like, what the fuck's wrong with you? It's like, I play in a metal band. And I'm playing like th- musical theater, but you say you can't hear yourself. I had a 412 cab. <laughs> but yes. that's the thing. I did one gig. There was only one gig in my entire life where I played with a full stack. And it was the worst gig I've ever done in my life because I could finally hear what was coming out of those speakers <laughs> because it was at head level. Whereas every other gig I'd done, the, the amp is like blaring behind my knees. Mm-hmm. And that's the sound I could, that affects the tone. It affects everything. <laughs> and when I could finally hear what was coming out at head level, I became incredibly aware of what every single little thing I was playing was to the point where I played really, really badly because I was so head. aware. I did, it did. It got in my head. And that's carried over and in, even into when I wear these things. Like... I, that's why I'm lower in the mix than everything else. Cause it's like, okay, I can hear but basically whether I'm in tune or not. That's it. That's all I need. I'm good. That's all I've ever needed to do from playing musical theater, playing in bars. I've never needed anything more than that. And I'm still a believer that if you are blaming the monitoring on a poor performance, there's something wrong with your ability. I'm going to, there's your blabber mouth headline. But, um, but I genuinely believe that it's like, well, you, if you're relying on the technology for you to do a good job, then something's gone wrong somewhere along the line. But I heard Vince Neil's monitor guy wasn't very good, which is the reason why he couldn't sing on this last tour in stadiums. You don't think so? 
I, I don't know. I don't know. I've not seen it. He can't blame his monitor pitch. guy. I saw him yelling at his monitor guy that he couldn't sing Girls, Girls, Girls. And I was like, it's clearly the monitor guy why Vince Neil can't sing. But there's also a... Maybe, maybe I'm being a bit unfair because I know it is different for vocalists. I know it is different for vocalists. I get that. Especially when you're in a stadium with millions of dollars yeah. of equipment to do everything you want. It, but, it's totally their fault. Oh, God. I'm, I might put my foot in it. I've got to be really careful how Come I Come on. We're this. talking about Vince Neil. He's terrible. Uh, I was going to relate it not to Vince Neil, but other people. Um, Ozzy? So, who, no, but let's, let's move away. Let's Step no away. no no. I'm going to go down this route, but it, I've got to be careful how I word it. Let's think about stadium filling bands in the seventies. What was their monitoring system like? They certainly didn't have in ears. Yeah, that's, that's and you look back at that footage. Look, look at like Led Zeppelin at Madison Square Garden. And tell me Robert Plant needs a monitor guy and in ears. He was just good at what he did. He didn't need to hear himself and he was still incredible. You know what I mean? Freddie Mercury, same thing. You go back and listen to like 1977 <laughs> at Earl's Court, which is not a very big show. His voice was so incredible. And the, the, the insane part is, is that Freddie Mercury got into Queen not because of his vocals, but because of his personality and the way he dressed. They're like, this guy could could be a front man. They mm. had no idea he was even a good singer. That's how yeah. much bravado he had. But if you go back and you listen to those soundboard recordings, Brian May used to say, like, I couldn't believe he hit that note and all that sort of thing. And back then, so you said at one point, because of, of auto-tuning and all these people have been growing up with like perfection, that they have great pitch. So that's a good thing. But back then, they didn't have any of that technological support. So you either had to be good or your dad smacked you in the back of the head and said, shut the fuck up. Well, I think, but this comes back to the point that, you know, if you are really good and you're well-practiced and well-rehearsed, you should be able to approximate that super high level very closely. And I I Mm. need to find it, but I had a friend from college that did a TEDx talk on this where she actually studied like uh, orchestral cellists, you know, and, you know, when you put cellists in a section in an orchestra, are they actually playing as well because they can't hear their individual sound, you know, as as closely as they can when they're practicing at home. And the results basically said that, you know, if they had rehearsed it enough that their muscle memory was in place, they actually did like so much percentage, almost exactly as well as they had done at home because, Mm. you know, but if they were showing up and they were relying on being able to hear themselves and they had to kind of frantically like pay attention to the music and there were all those external variables that it was not as close. So yeah, I mean, it proves the point that you know, it comes down to the, the the level of preparation and, you know, being able to survive when you can't hear yourself that well. An iPod is always prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're uh, we're up against a hard deadline today. Uh, Richard, uh, you mentioned that there was something that you might be able to talk about uh, on the show. Yeah, it's, it's weird because when you guys asked me to be back on, I was like, well, I've got nothing to really talk about. I'm like, really boring now i don't we have had a anything. great conversation though we had plenty to talk about see <laughs> yeah we did yeah this is very true just just because we got good conversation with friends that's the way i see it and that's what naturally happens you know but um in terms of projects i didn't have much on at all like i say this song with danny just for fun and then i got approached by something called lick library which I don't know if you've heard of it uh, uh, over there, but it's a big online thing. But in the UK, especially when I was growing up playing guitar, the Lick Library was huge. It was like they had all these books, like play along with Thin Lizzy things, and they'd make CD backing tracks and all this kind of stuff. Basically, all the guitar magazines in the UK, the guys who wrote for those magazines wrote for Lick Library as well. And then when YouTube became a thing, they started doing like online content. And now they've got on their website, you can still order the DVDs and the books and everything, but they almost do it like a Netflix service where it's like pay a monthly subscription and you can basically click on any guitar course that they have where you can learn like Sam Bell will teach you note for note the entire cowboys from hell record or <laughs> like what like stuff like that or how to play in this weirdly enough guthrie govan used to be the, one of the lick library guys back in the day which is how i first heard of guthrie govan before he went off and became the guthrie we know him to be now and the absolute legend that he is uh andy james who is now in five finger death punch he was 
one of the lit library guys and i got approached uh two years ago by them wheeling enough asking if i'd do it and it just didn't make sense uh, our son rory had just been born i was still in cradle everything was crazy i was like i don't know how i'm gonna have time for this and then weirdly enough they approached me a few weeks ago saying we still want you but if now that you're not in cradle and we know you're a bit more uh more diverse than just being the metal guy would you like to do lots of different things and uh, do you have the time to do it now? And I was like, absolutely, I'd love to do it because, in my opinion, those are the guys who taught me how to play guitar when I was a kid. So That's now amazing. it was almost like one of these little ticks where I'm like, I'm going to be one of those guys. So, congratulations! Very, very cool. the, the first off, congratulations! And how Thanks. cool is it that you get paid to learn the kind of things that you you had to learn growing up to teach back to people? Like that is a full circle. Like, it, what type of weird. music are you learning right now? So the first course I'm doing, which is very interesting, I think Ben and Corey, you might be maybe able to help me out with this. It's the best guitar solos of the '90s. Oh, oh, I can help you out with wow. that. <laughs> that is yeah. not Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Alice in Chains, or Pantera. Okay. Because the only reason they've told me not to do those is because they've already done courses on all of those mm. bands. So they've already got stuff on the website. So we've got some stuff on there that will make people go, oh, I forgot that song even existed. But they've got incredible guitar solos. Kim Fail doing Black Hole Sun is one of the most ridiculous. Yeah. Did you yeah. do it's, it? It's funny you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fucking hard song and it's so yeah. hard to get it right because it's like i don't know what mode it's in or something but like he plays so unconventionally that if you're used to like doing these technical 80 solos you're like kim thales like i'm speaking greek to you yeah but it's i'm learning it at the moment for it and i'm like this is so obviously improvised off the cuff it's like okay something like this and that was probably just the, the, the take that made the record and you can't ever replicate that again yeah yep. i've got to try and replicate that so <laughs> that's like an extra level of difficulty when you get those kind of guitar solos i mean this stuff like we, we we're going to do uh, in theory we're going to do both guitar solos and give in to me by michael jackson that slash did wow. and people it's not until i mention that where people go oh that song's amazing but they don't necessarily think of it being a guitar song of the 90s but it's like it's slash <laughs> yeah yeah well this comes back to what we talked about in in, in part one of just like great ways to get people to go back into music or rediscover music. And I think this is awesome because I think you're going to open up the door for people to want to get into guitar or just songs that they haven't thought about and, and bring the guitar light into it. You know, that is super cool. It's, it's very yeah. cool. I get to play Shania Twain. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have built big guilty pleasure for the guitar parts on Shania Twain records by the great, Brent Mason and all that. And and I actually get to do the first guitar solo I ever learnt on this course as well. I mentioned it to them. The first, yeah, the first guitar solo I ever learned when I've been playing guitar for about six months. I, I'm actually going to be teaching it, <laughs> but, which is a, a Dance for Night Away by the Mavericks. Oh, do you wow. remember that one? Was that a hit yeah. in the U UK? In it, the wasn't, US? It, wasn't, it wasn't that big, but... It was it, huge I in the UK which is weird because nobody ever heard from him again after that. <laughs> but that guitar solo is great. And I, I mentioned it to the Lit Library guys and they're like, oh, you have to do that. <laughs> yeah, like People don't take it that seriously, but when you look at it, it's like that's a really cool classic like rockabilly guitar solo. Um, that's not too difficult. So it's, it's, as I say, I've been playing guitar for six months and I, I learned it. But there's, there's all kinds of cool stuff like that. Obviously, there's like the Rage Against Machines uh, of the world. Uh, we were talking about doing some on Vogue and all this kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah, I so talk I, low then. I think I think um, "Free Your Mind" is one of the greatest guitar riffs in history. Did it? Did it? It's like almost like Bon Jovi uh, "Living on a Prayer" if it was cooler and groovier. Yeah, weirdly enough, we talked about doing that, uh, but the decision was only made a couple of days ago. Where it's like it's an, an amazing song. It's a classic song. But I think people think more of the song and the riff more than the guitar solo. Mm -hmm. Oh no, for the guitar solo, it's definitely not the same. So it's, it's like the not riff. a classic. So we, so we might in future do that. It was the same for a uh, 
Black Cat by Janet Jackson. We were going to do that one, but that's that an came 80s out, song, though. But that came out in '89, so I was. They said, "Can you do Black Cat?" And I was like, "Well, that's '89." And they're like, mm. "Yeah, but the single came out in '90." I was like, "Now you're just <laughs> grabbing at straws. You just really want me to do it." Was Living Color Cult of Personality? I think that's '90s, isn't it? Uh, testing my knowledge i think it was like 89 or 90 i might be completely wrong with that i think it's on but uh it's stuff like that where we're we're just kind of freestyling going this is actually quite difficult to whittle it down if you take away like classic rock and metal bands like trying to do 88 oh there you go but there was talk of doing more and the reason i'm mentioning all this because obviously because with lit library they're like whatever i come up with or whatever they come up with they're going to come to me and say how about we do this we might do a best guitar solos of the 2000s have they already done ozzy like perry mason is one of my favorite zach wild solos uh well enough we are gonna do an ozzy track uh we, we are gonna do no more tears that's a good one surprisingly I mean, that's one of the great solos. it is an incredible slow solo and surprisingly lit library have never covered it so they're like well we can do it because we've never covered no more tears so yeah, get, like there's stuff the like we can do smooth by santana get, get the funk out and stuff get like the that funk out. Get, get, get the, the funk out bro. get the funk out they've already done oh, so no. ah. i said to them i was like we could basically man, think of anything from Paul you had a flight of the wounded onwards. bumblebee sam oh. bell who is an incredible guitar teacher and guitar player he's already done pornography team note for note the okay. entire of album yeah. so and that's one worth it that's why they can't that's why i'm not going to do that there's no point rest in peace <laughs> possibly i might have to ask him about that so anything on, off off three sides yeah. dude don't don't you didn't you cover one of the tunes off three sides and nuno even commented on it yeah nuno still doesn't know who i am i have this feeling um <laughs> even though i've done obviously this song with them and before i even know, knew who you guys were i did uh i just put a cover of me playing warheads uh, and Nuno commented it on it. I was literally brand new to Instagram. I was like, let's see what this Instagram thing is about. People like guitar solo videos. Oh, I'll do. I don't do many anymore. But I was like, oh, let's see what it's like. And then Nuno commented on it, saying I played it better than he does because the way he plays it doesn't actually ergonomically make sense. But the way <laughs> I did makes sense, so he might play it like that in the future, which really freaked me out. Put that in your tombstone. That's that's all I, you need. Yeah. I thought that's how we played it. That's why. That's the only reason I played it like that, because I thought that's how he played it. It turns out it's really not how we played it, because nobody can play like Nuno. Yeah. So it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> so yeah. it was, But he still doesn't know who I am. He's in his own world. I can tell yeah. you how you get Nuno to remember you. Oh, I'm how? sure you, you just, can. Yeah, you just annoy him so much, and you call him so much for like 10, 15 years, and he figures out who you are so he doesn't pick up his phone. Is, is that how it worked for you? You know, I, I say that, but then like Nuno, like he'll send me like a really nice text out of nowhere, like a happy holidays or like a meme of himself or something. And then I'll message him and, and he'll be like, why are you, why would you ever ask me that? He's very, uh, I'm just happy he's in my life. That, that, that was me with certain people when they follow me on Instagram. That's it. I'm going to Sharice, my girlfriend going, oh my God, like <laughs> Miles <laughs> Kennedy follows me on Instagram. Like I completely freaked out when that happened. Wow. Like I was like. We've never chatted since, but he just started following me on Instagram like, like about a year ago or so. And I was like, Sharice, Sharice, like all these guys follow me. And she's we love like, Miles, man. He's, he's one Miles of the greatest vocalists great. in his and incredible guitarist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, fanboy, yeah. but, <laughs> there we go. but, but, but like, I just re- remember like, we, <laughs> like every time that happens, I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, I do fanboy still a little bit. And I think the fanboy needs to be in there a little bit. Otherwise, I'll become old and jaded and, you know, complaining how all music sucks. And it was better in my day. I don't want to be that guy, you know. <laughs> That's the worst thing. I mean, I used to love Ozzy so much to the point where, like, I'd cry when he came out. I was like, oh, my God, he must hang upside down. He's evil. And he's been so destroyed for me. But between the television shows, the fact that Sharon keeps pushing him and all that. So the mystique is gone. Like, you know what I mean? Like, to go from being so excited to the point where like, I was ready to quit a school play. Because it was on the same night that Corn and Ozzy played. My mom was like, you don't do that. That's just bad. It's bad juju. And I'm like, okay. And I was mad because I couldn't go see Ozzy Osbourne, even though I've been working on this play for like four months. Like that's how much I love them. And now if he came to town, I would, I, I probably wouldn't know until I saw the tickets on my Facebook feed, you know? And so, so to have that love, like, I mean, I remember you posted that you went and saw Slipknot 
and and Alter Bridge, and to see you have that excitement still. That uh, I think uh, Shannon calls it uh, awe and wonder, wonder and awe, Close wonder that. and awe. Yeah. There you go. It's better. <laughs> I reversed yeah. it. Um, but that's a great feeling to have for music. And, and it's when that dies completely that, you know, it's over. I, I was worried, like, having worked with Cradle and, like, you see behind the curtain. It's like, I don't know. I mean, sp- spoiler alert for anyone who's not seen The Wizard of Oz. I mean, it's been it's nearly 100 years old, so get around to it if you haven't. Uh, but it's like the, the end scene like you're looking behind the curtain and it's just a guy i was worried that working with cradle and doing all these incredible things i got to do that it would kind of make me a bit jaded where it's like oh it's only it's only this it's only that you kind of downplay it a little bit but even more so now that i've been out of the band for a while it's like i i i'm so thankful that i still have that that wonder and all that I, 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 and like you say, if that ever leaves, it would be quite a sad existence, I feel. <laughs> like, and, and I don't I hope it won't. Do you think it makes you respect certain bands more that now you oh, know how yeah. it's really done? Like, oh, yeah. What a, give me an example of a band that you respect more now that you've actually done it, that now you understand something that maybe as just someone watching it, you wouldn't get. T- to be fair, most bands, any band that's been together longer than like five years. It, it, like when you think of I know big Metallic fans and like like we think how does a band stay together for that long? How how do the Stones keep together for that long? Like millions like, of dollars. Yeah. It, it helps. It might help. I, I think it helps. <laughs> but at the same time, there are bands that will never get bigger than playing to like five hundred people max, like and on a night. Every, every night of a tour and they will keep going purely because they love it and I just think that's incredible like like the fact that some of these bands original lineups you know like they just do it because they can't stop and I think that's the Aussie thing weirdly enough the Aussie thing for me is I think I don't want to put it out there but I'm going to say it anyway the moment he retires I reckon that's it for Ozzy. He, so he has I, nothing to live for. People give Sharon shit, and I can understand why they give Sharon shit. But if Ozzy stops, that's it. And I don't want to see him go just yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he needs to play. He opened that football stadium, and they had him finally lip syncing. Everyone said he sounded good. It's like he hasn't sounded good in 15 years because he's deaf and can't sing anymore. But you see him just up there smiling. And that's one of those things where it's like, that's probably the only place he's truly happy. Exactly. And now it's kind of like, we're just being like, it's like going to the old person's home and playing solid, uh, not solid war with your grandmother, just because she, you know, it's good for her. It's like letting Ozzy go on stage and lip sync with Zach Wilde because it's, he needs it or he's going to die. He just needs to be on stage. And again, that's, I think the respect I have for all these people where you just go, they do it because they love it. They could have retired a long time ago and just sat and counted the money but they do it because they need it. And it's amazing how many people I met in the industry who aren't like that yet. That's probably the reason in a weird way, they're not as successful. They don't do it because they need it. They do it because they need the money, not because they need to perform. And agreed. I think those are the people I have the biggest respect for, the people who do it for no other reason. They could have happily retired a long time ago, but they have to perform. Amen. I think it's a good place to uh, to wrap up. And now for Jerry Springer's final thoughts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we appreciate you hanging with us, man. It's, it's always just such a good time. We came in with no agenda, no topics, and we blew through these episodes. And, and you know, it's it's always a treat. We're always enlightened by your ideas. It's You're such a good friend to us. And thank you so much for coming back and spending so much time with us. I, I feel like we've grown with you in so many ways. And it's, it's just really cool to constantly be on your journey and to follow the things that you're doing and so excited for the stuff that you've talked about and what's coming up. Well, one of the things that I learned from your early episodes was always be ready, always be ready. And, you know, we've been friends with you while you were kind of acclimating to cradle of filth. You had a child and now you're going back and you're becoming, I mean, you've always been a teacher, but you've not only written a book, which is incredibly impressive, but now you're going to go and teach people in a way that they're going to learn the same way that you learned you know, operantly conditioning them to be great players through um, this new opportunity. 
And it's such an awesome progression of somebody who's ready because you're ready to learn that Kim fail. So, and we know that you're competent to do it. So it's truly a pleasure to watch you grow and also to be a part of music with you. I'm go- I'm so thankful that you were on Lost Symphony, but I'm also thankful that you came to me and said, Hey, can, can we get some drums and can we, can you give me your thoughts on this? And I still get to be a part of your musical journey and it's an honor. Well, thank you very much. And it's an honor to talk with you guys and uh, I hope we get to do it again soon. We absolutely will. All right, guys, check out 2020-d.com. We'll have links to all of Richard's stuff in the description, and uh, we'll see you next week. You develop a fan base, right? And you're so, if you can do that, you're so lucky. And then you don't want to do things that are going to alienate them. So if they, you know, it's kind of like if you're a restaurant and you are known for making hamburgers and then suddenly you're trying to make sushi, people will be like, wait a minute here, you've, you've, you've lost me. But at the same time, you don't want to create the same exact ham. Well, I guess you could do that. And that's kind of probably a bad, bad example. You're but the McDonald's, well McDonald's of music yeah. miles. <laughs> <laughs> Burger King. And, and so it's, Have it your way, man. Your way. So it's the idea that, that like... You, you want to continue to evolve to a point without alienating your fan base. Then, okay, but here's the problem for a guy like me, is that if you have a really wide range of things that you love and want to try as a, as a writer, and you can't expect to do that in that realm, that's why you, have, you develop a solo project. Because then it's like, all right, this is me trying all this other stuff. And if you if you enjoy it, great. I would love to have you come along for the for the song journey. If not, there's Alter Bridge or there's Slash, and so that's. I feel like as a as a creative entity, I'm 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 fortunate to have all of that now.